Well, thank you very much, Steve. That's very kind of you. And uh, Austin, it was fascinating to learn a bit about the, the work that Alec is doing in this area. So for the next few minutes, I'm uh, not going to be talking about mowers, but I've been asked to give you a bit of an overview of uh, how sustainability is um, affecting the sports industry and um, use, go back in time a little bit to London 2012, which I can't believe really it's nearly seven years ago since, uh, since the Games, and uh, look at some of the things we were doing then and how that has sort of uh, driven a certain legacy of thinking in sustainability in the wider sports sector. So I'll uh, touch a bit on what we did in London, but also look at more recent things and what's happening in this area and think a bit about what next. But what are these sustainability challenges that we're facing? And while we can go back over many decades of how this story has been building up, we cannot fail to have noticed just recently how significant this has come in the public eye. And it's all kicking off at once, isn't it? We've had this Extinction Rebellion protests uh, throughout um, April in London. We had um, David Attenborough and the, uh, his big piece on, on climate change recently. And we had the whole school strike movement with the 16-year-old um, Greta Thunberg, from, uh, who's inspired that from Sweden. So we've got the wonderful juxtaposition of teenagers going on protest in schools, 93-year-old David Attenborough, and amongst all that, lots of science and serious heavyweight reports. So just, recent, just a week or so back, the UN launched this uh, study showing how like a million species are on the verge of extinction. And the, the world's ecosystems are under amazing stress. And uh, a lot of that, most of that is down to human activity and what we, we really need to think about how we can collectively do something to try and overturn those trends. So there's a lot going on there, but if we turn it more specifically to sport, just over a year ago, I don't know if any, many of you have, or any of you have seen this, but the um, uh, report highlighted there on the left called Game Changer, and that looks at how climate change is directly impacting onto sports in the UK and it's all about how the extremes of weather, and you can chart how across recent decades, the number of days of play lost to whether it's flooding or drought or uh, etc. If we've got golf courses crumbling into the ocean and a whole range of other sort of side effects from weather pattern changes. So whether it's pests and diseases that are more prevalent in certain areas that are affecting turf grass management, there's a lot of different uh, impacts and all this is impacting on the on the games that we love and of course if you're losing play to weather then you've got the uh, the loss of revenue of tickets and so on or you have the expense of putting in weatherproof stadia and so on so there's a, a lot of issues and it's not just in the UK uh, no um, 2016 uh, you mentioned uh, the India Premier League and the of cricket and how important that is in 2016, in Madhya Pradesh, the government, a court order was given to move 13 matches out of the state because they're under such drought stress, all watering uh, of sports grounds and things were stopped. So these matches of the Premier League, which are real big ticket things, had to be relocated to other areas, and that is not a small deal. Or you've got in tennis, look at the Australian Tennis Open, how more and more players are really suffering in the extreme heats of uh, January in Melbourne. And I do wonder things like the Summer Olympic Games. Next year, we're going to be in Tokyo. It is baking hot in July, not just hot, but it's humid, almost to the point of endurance. And uh, when you're looking at really um, world-class endurance sports in those conditions, plus the people who have to work in it and spectators and so on, will the Summer Olympics be the Summer Olympics in a decade or so's time? I do wonder whether they're going to have to shift them to the autumn, and that wreaks havoc with all sorts of us schedules, sports fixtures, broadcasting, and so on. These are going to be really big consequences. And then the net zero UK contribution to stopping global warming, that was a report just out a week or so back from the UK's Climate Change Committee, which really looking at how is the UK going to move forward to, in 2050, becoming net zero carbon. And it's not just about climate change. The other big topic that's been around lately has been the um, 
uh, issue around ocean plastic or plastic pollution generally and how so much of this rubbish is getting into deep oceans. Just yesterday there was a report about plastic waste right at the bottom, the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that lovely picture on the left was taken in Doha, so uh, next door to the Hilton Hotel. <laughs> and uh, it's what can sport as a net sector do to help contribute to um, overcoming these issues. But you also depend on a clean environment. Austin talked a bit about the um, particulate matters and the, uh, the fumes from diesel and petrol mowers, but air quality is a massively important issue for people generally. It's a real health issue in London and other big cities, but it's also vital for athletic performance. So having clean environments, whether it's for swimming in, breathing or whatever, is fundamental to the industry. So that's sort of the challenge. Now we're going to step back in time to that wonderful era when people smiled and talked to each other, called 2012. And uh, we transformed what was a vast area of derelict industrial waste ground into what is now the Queen, Eliz Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. But this is the, the scene just in advance of, of the Games. And there's a whole raft of sustainability um, aspects to it. Probably a little bit faint for those at the back, but just to highlight a few things. So we cleaned up the waterways, revegetating some of the river margins. A lot of temporary structures, because you don't build stuff you don't need or have white elephant venues for, for uh, that's been one of the problems of some of these mega events, building stuff that had no viable long-term legacy. So it was a big emphasis on putting in temporary structures that can be demountable and then reused or um, repurposed in some other way. Uh, the TV studios, the um, merchandise store, and many other aspects were done on a temporary basis. Even the bridges the, across the, um, uh, the waterways, they were wide for the crowds that we needed at Olympic Games time, but they were reduced to a more sensible size for their long-term legacy use. The park landscaping, putting in accessible gradients and all the other stuff, just even the, uh, the legible wayfinding, so that it is something that is accessible and inclusive to everyone. It's not just about environmental things, it's about the whole uh, package of being uh, socially responsible. And to me, it was ultimately the park itself. This amazing wetland bowl, which was a great, it's a great amenity, it's also a great place for wildlife, but significantly, by having carved out this bowl from what was originally a straight, steep-sided, polluted waterway with contaminated land on either side, that engineering work has taken several thousand properties out of flood risk. So you've got ecological uh, value, you've got public amenity, and you've got the socio-economic benefit of reduced flood risk. That is good thinking. And Simon Barnes is a great writer in The Times on the opening day of the Games. He said, I've been to plenty of impressive places to cover sporting events, and they're hard, tough, uncompromising. They're places to visit and be awed, not places to feel at home in. For the first time in my experience, a great sporting event will be happening in a nice place. That's a triumph, and one that should be copied wherever great sport takes place. So I hope some of you who went to the Games, or if not, have been to the Olympic Park since. And if you haven't, well worth going to have a look at it. I think he was referring to things like Beijing Olympic Park, which were just ginormous, huge venues, awesome, but not at a scale which uh, is, is, is sort of human friendly. And I think one of the successes of 2012 was staging great games in that amazing landscape. And it wasn't just the Olympic Park, it was many other venues too. And it's not just about the place. It's also all the operational services that go around sports events that have a big impact. So travel, transport is one of those big areas. And we've got to look more and more and more at how do we get people to and from events in a more sustainable way. So cycling to, to events, walking, trains, long distance trains, all really critical. An area we looked at which hadn't really been looked at before was food. Now, you hear a lot nowadays about one's food footprint. If people ask, what can I actually do personally to uh, help towards mitigating climate impact? Everyone says, eat less red meat. And that's true because red meat is the highest uh, sort of carbon factor in, in your diet. 
But we were looking not just on that aspect, we were thinking, you don't often go to a sports event and have great food unless you're in the hospitality. And wouldn't it be nice if there was a better choice, better range, more diverse um, food, that affordable, good quality, and responsibly sourced. So we used Farm Assured Red Tractor, we had Marine Stewardship Council fish, stuff that couldn't be produced locally or in the UK was uh, source fair trade and um, it's not just about the food. What happens to all the waste and stuff afterwards, all the paper cups and plates and so on. And we use one supplier, we had 12 caterers, but we made them all source from London Bio Packaging, so it was a compostable um, set of materials. And for example, these paper cups, the little orange symbol there, that was linked to the orange colour on the waste bin. So all that went into the composting stream. Green was for the dry recyclables, like the cups and bottles. And then we had a much smaller black for the um, general waste. It's not a perfect system, but we managed to achieve a very significant um, reuse and recycling rate, uh, or recycling rate from that, sorry. Um, so that... Uh, we, we minimise the amount of general waste and none of it actually went to landfill. Even the, the general waste was used for energy production. And then lots of other hidden stories. The flowers for the victory bouquets were all sourced from a local supplier, UK grown. The, the fabrics and the materials for the, the look were all of a recyclable sort. But more importantly, having Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, we were the first to really try and co-brand those and limit the transition from one games to the other. So often in the past it had been a complete new look and refit which was very wasteful. The medals, where does the metal come from? So with our partner we, um, trial, we trialled a sort of chain of custody for metal so we know exactly which mine the metal came from that went through all the various stages through to the mint to make the medals that uh, um, were handed out and that is not an easy thing. The metal market is very difficult to know where stuff comes from and we know there's an awful lot of environmental and human rights issues in the mining industry so to be able to know and trace your metal all the way through was quite an innovation. And then the uniforms, vast amount of the materials was recycled products in the, in the shirts, the trousers. The shoes were designed in such a way they were what they call pattern efficient, so the amount of, sort of mould that was wasted when they cut out the shoes was, um, was minimised and uh, that was a significant advance. And one little example here I thought was quite nice. In Beijing they had a roof mounted cauldron, the Olympic flame, up on the top of the Bird's Nest Stadium. 300 tonnes and a real gas guzzler. Pretty well every moth in China was attracted to it. We had a lightweight stadium roof, so we were, <laughs> by default, we could not stick anything on the roof because we basically didn't have a roof. And so we decided we'd have a floor-mounted um, cauldron. But that itself was only 16 tonnes compared with 300 tonnes. And it used about a tenth of the amount of gas in the flame. And there was a great story around it. If you remember back to the opening ceremony, it wasn't some famous has-been star that was going to light the flame. It was actually seven young up-and-coming athletes, the next generation, that finally lit the flame. And those vertical rods, each one represented one of the competing nations. And when it was all extinguished afterwards, the sort of the petal, the bowl where the flame was coming out of at the top of those, was donated to each Olympic, National Olympic Committee as a souvenir of the Games. So it was all, um, had some value afterwards. Moving forward now, we've done London, <laughs> uh, next year Tokyo, and their approach on the metals is using, getting, extracting metal from re, uh, redundant electric components. So people are giving all their old mobile phones and other electric gadgets, and they've been able to extract enough metal to make their metals from, from that. So that's interesting innovation. And it's not just the Olympic Games. Just recently we've had the London Marathon and Hugh Bracia, the director there, is a real enthusiast for this, a real leader in this uh, whole area. And one of the innovations this year, trying to get away from this sea of plastic bottles. It'll take time to get rid of them all, but 
the child a seaweed-based water capsule handed out instead. And it'd uh, be interesting to know more about how that went. But the idea was to use 215,000 fewer plastic bottles. Any of you know Forest Green Rovers? It's, um, I can't remember which league it's in, but it is the world's greenest football club. It's somewhere in Gloucestershire, and they are 100% vegan. I mentioned the red meat thing. Well, there's no red meat at Forest Green Rovers. And it's not just about the high environmental impact and the animal welfare issues, but it's also about improving player performance and giving fans a healthier and tastier food on match days. And again, it's a leadership thing. The guy who owns and uh, runs that club is absolutely driven on this agenda and it just permeates the whole way they do things. While over in France, their Premier League has signed up this year with WWF to try and promote a whole range of activities around things such as uh, beach cleanups, reforestation and eco-citizen behavioural initiatives, as they call it. Last year, Volvo Ocean Race really did some amazing work on this. And it's not just sailing. If you think they have stages around the world, about nine or ten different ports they use where uh, in various stages start and finish. And there's a whole hullabaloo around there. There's like a festival, so you've got the teams, you've got shows, you've got hospitality. So there's a whole pile of work they did around minimising the impacts of those events, plus looking at the whole ocean um, going side of things and they married that with a lot of scientific research so the as the yachts were sailing across the world they were helping contribute to research around ocean plastic and some fascinating work come out of that and then recently uh, just the end of last year the united nations climate change in partnership with the international olympic committee launched the sports for climate action framework and already there's a whole pile of major sporting bodies that have signed up and pledged to support this initiative, which is based around a number of principles. And uh, there's a link there that, oh, incidentally, this presentation will be emailed out to everyone afterwards, I believe. So there are some links and things I've put in the slides so that you can follow up if you're interested in some of the documentation. But we've got things like the IOC, FIFA, French Tennis Federation, IAAF, the Green Sports Alliance, National Hockey League, AEG Worldwide, lots and lots of different organisations are signing up to this. So this is quite a movement coming along in the sporting sector. Another uh, sort of legacy moment from London 2012, one of the things we recognised was a gap in the market for a prop sort of structured approach to putting sustainability into the way we operated. We needed a management system that was relevant to the event sector and sports event sector. And we worked with British Standards to create something which gave us a bit of structure and rigour around this. And that developed into a thing called British Standard 8901 at the time. And they were so pleased with that, they said, let's make this international. And so by 2012, it was recalibrated into what is now known as ISO 2012-1. So it's a management system standard for the event sector. And it isn't just about Olympic Games, it could be regularly recurring events, it could be a stadium, it could be suppliers, one-off events, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's you know, caught on around the world in particular. Not so big in this country, unfortunately, but maybe it'll come back. But uh, things like Ben Ainsley, the America's Racing Cup, uh, Ben Ainsley Racing, sorry, for the America's Cup, Roland Garros and the French Tennis Federation have gone down this route. The UEFA Euro 2016 was certified to the standard. World Sailing, uh, last year, they've embraced it. Uh, Formula E, not surprisingly. Um, subsequent Olympic Games, and Rio had it. Tokyo are going for it. And many, many more. And it's not just in the sports sector. So it's, you know, bizarrely, things like Eurovision Song Contest in 2013, all the way through to World Expos, um, the big climate conference in Paris in 2015, more recently the G7 that was held in Metz, and the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos. All of them are now embracing this standard and using it as a tool to try and drive better sustainability performance. And then there's a lot of knowledge legacy that's now been mainstreamed into guidance produced by the International Olympic Committee. So one of the main things anyone can do is look at how they source goods and services and take better informed decisions on, on the sort of, uh, 
the impacts and the benefits of choosing one product or service over another. So your performance can be very much guided by your procurement. And to that end, there's um, a supplier code, the IC operates itself. There's also produced guidance book for Olympic Games organising committees on setting up a whole sustainable sourcing programme. And that is something that could also apply to many other organisations. And they've also produced a carbon footprint methodology so that future host cities can map out where their impacts are likely to be and what they can do going forward. And if you want something simpler, where do we start? How do we get into this? There's also produced a series of things under the Sustainability Essentials series, Introduction to Sustainability, Sports for Climate Action, and Sustainable Sourcing in Sport. And these are basic sort of entry-level 101 guides on those topics, and they would apply to any sports organisation. Primarily, they were directed for National Olympic Committees and International Federations, but clubs, stadia, teams, leagues, whatever, could easily use those and apply them. It's all open source and available on the IC website. So in closing, just some sort of challenges and thoughts of what's ahead, what are the things that are really going to, uh, we need to think about more, and what can this sector do to um, improve its performance? Is that just going to be an excuse to have bigger, better TV coverage, or can these technologies be used to downsize the footprint of things like broadcasting, which is massive? And how do we eliminate single-use plastics? It's not just about a few straws here and there. There's a whole mass of stuff. What about the film and packaging that goes with so much catering and supply material? There's a lot to do there, but the potents are good. Portents are good. Um, the Mayor of Paris, Mayor of Los Angeles, signed up a cooperation for their successive games around sustainability and innovation. We've got a lot more events and federations and organisations in the sector heading in this direction. So big challenges, but I hope I've given you a quick whiz through and a flavour of um, there is so much going on. And uh, I will leave you with that image of London 2012 and very happy to take any questions if, if anyone has any. Thank you very much. <laughs>